it's all official. I have a two book deal with Penguin Berkeley. And the first book is the first book will be out summer of next year, and the second book will be out the uh, year after that. Is this your first publication? Um, yep, this is the very first one. This is actually my ninth manuscript that I finished. Wow. Okay, that's interesting. Um, what happened to the first? Uh, well, you finished one of the two, right? Yeah. So, what happened to the first eight? I would call them like, you know how you have to get better to get to a certain point? Yeah. The first seven were that they're never ever going to see the light of day. They're hidden wow. somewhere. It's embarrassing. Interesting. Because yeah. I mean, we, have, we live in a world where everybody's publishing anything they write, throwing it on the internet, putting it on Amazon, going, this is the next American novel, but you are holding on to eight of them. They're not good. They're not good, Brian. They're <laughs> really not good. That's not your job, though, to say, is it? Who told you the one that you are getting published was good? Well, um, my publishing journey is a little bit interesting in that it was manuscript number eight. The manuscript number seven was the one that I actually started querying, like, you know, with agents and stuff. And, uh -huh. I, and that one is the first time I actually got full requests and all of that. I actually got like an R&R &R with that one, like a revise and resubmit with an agent. That's interesting. How that, I mean, that was hard, I bet. Did they give you specifics that they wanted to see changed or was it just kind of, this is good, but um, give us another draft? This one, I, I'm still I'm still friends with that agent. I didn't sign, uh, obviously we didn't, it didn't work out because I'm with a different agent, but she uh -huh. was, she was excellent. She had notes and she was willing to do like line edits with me. But the thing was, my vision was different from what she wanted. So it didn't work out. So you stuck to what you thought the story should be. Yeah. And oddly enough, after that one, I started writing again, but in a more literary vein. What's that mean? Um, better prose i i tried to make sure that the prose was you know like a lot more lyrical more lush description so i started querying that one and that's the one that i got my first agent with manuscript number eight oh, and wow. i'm no longer with that agent it was an amicable parting but yeah it didn't work out and that's the thing that a lot of writers don't really know if they're starting out is that sometimes when you get an agent it's not always going to be like the first one that you'll have forever it's very common to go on and get your second or even your third i mean we have to be fair when i heard the uh the premise of the novel that you, you're getting published i got mad it's that good oh like, thank it's, you <laughs> it's really really good and i'm like i should have thought of that so like what is it it's a chinese chef it's an asian chef it's a chinese chef who has tell me the story <laughs> uh, the Chinese, um, the comp title that the comp titles that I used when I pitched it was uh, "Shokola Meets Big Fish." When a chef or an aspiring chef comes home after her mother's death to reopen the family restaurant in Chinatown, San Francisco. It's just good, right? I mean, that's number eight. What was number one? Oh Lord, <laughs> number one was a romance novel. Oh wow! Okay, do you like, like romance? One, yeah, one to five were romances, and then like six and seven was fantasy. Oh wow! Eight, the one that I queried was under literary, and this one is women's fiction. This one's women's fiction. Yeah, I would call. It, I would have said magic realism. Yeah, I, I think so. I think that it's under women's fic because the protagonist is, you know, female. And magical realism, it falls under fantasy, right? Or sometimes spec fic. So I had a I had a professor who writes magical realism, and I asked him once, "Oh, so you're spec fic?" And he goes, "No." <laughs> <laughs> so it does not apply. Maybe this is your second literary novel. Yeah, this one definitely has lyrical prose, but it's more it's more commercial. Like mm -hmm. the concept itself, the premise, everything's more commercial. It's kind of that nice fine line between commercial and literary. So, I mean, what do you give uh, the most credit to? Is it just the fact that you worked really hard? Or do you think the climate is kind of hungering for this kind of other voice? One, stubbornness. 
because <laughs> yeah, that does help, you know, doesn't it? yep, we need to be stubborn. I mean, there's a ton, a ton of rejection in this business. Yeah. Second, hard work. You just have to work hard. And the third, luck. I can't discount, discount luck. Just being well, at did, the right place at the right how time. How did you luck out? Where were you? That was the right place at the right time. Um, like my agent is absolutely amazing and what happened was how i got her i entered this uh twitter this twitter event called dv pit and it's created by beth Bielen, and it gives marginalized authors a chance to pitch online their manuscripts what so is this had... pitch battles what is it again I've uh dv D- D- pit so that's different than pitch battles or yeah. what is it called am i thinking the right thing because i think pit. i saw you I happened Pit upon Mad. one of your, what is it? Pit Mad, I think it's the one, the most popular one that you probably have seen on the feed or on Twitter. I saw you tweet just accidentally the other day about a battle type thing. Was that what we're talking about? Oh, that's Pitch Wars. Pitch Wars. Yeah. Pitch yeah. Wars. Yeah. That's a different, that's a different one, but that's yeah. That's the this, one I'm familiar with. Yeah. This one was DV Pit and you get your pitch out there and my agent, Jenny Bent, favorited my pitch I sent it off to her and about 10 days later she offered wow which is incredible because when I started querying she was at the top of my list I'm like maybe one day and it happened and she is like I've learned so much from her because she's very she's highly editorial and just so smart so when did you write that first novel how long ago? Like number of years? How High long school. did it take? High school. Yeah. And that wasn't very long ago. <laughs> oh, no, no. That was a very long time ago for me. <laughs> well, I mean, I won't ask you specifically how old you are, but it is interesting to find that you wrote your first novel in high school. And here, X number of millennia later, later you're you're publishing legitimately. It's an, it's an interesting journey. I read a quote, and I think it applies, right? I mean... This uh, comic book artist was asked, how do you become successful in the business? And her answer was basically, um, keep doing art and keep doing art and keep doing art until they get sick of you and know that you're not going away. And then maybe eventually you'll be you know, successful. It's kind of apropos, huh? I remember seeing that tweet and yeah, it resonated. It definitely did. You just oh, mis- misquoting it completely. But oh, no, 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 you got it. Hard. Yep, you got it. I think it's I think it's very important to stick your nose in there and just keep digging. I mean, eventually you'll find a truffle maybe or, you know, die and then <laughs> it won't matter if you find one or not. Um, what's the next step for you? What are you working on now? Um, I'm still waiting on my book one notes and oh. yeah. And then I have to think about book two and there's all of these dates, all of these new things that you've learned because this is all obviously new to me I've never been published before so trying to it's just trying to find all of your friends who have been who have gone through a debut asking them all of the information because not a lot is out there on the internet to go research this kind of stuff yeah I mean at this point you have to be kind of familiar with an author's career and kind of see how they've worked it I mean who do you follow in terms of um who are your favorites? Who is doing the stuff that you want to be doing? Because, I mean, in terms of like what they did for their first novel, I think you would do the same thing. Kind of, right? Um, like one, two, two Asian writers that I really admire are obviously Amy Tan, who's shaped me. Yeah, I guess she's writer. One, the most yep, important writer. One, right? Is she yep. considered fantasy now or is she is she literary? I think he's under general thick, although her prose is general very literary. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, she wrote, God, what was the name of that? Uh, Joy Luck Club. In, Joy Luck Club, yeah. That was yeah. made into a movie back in the 90s. Um, number two? Kevin Kwan, Crazy Rich Asians. Great, great <laughs> series. I've never heard of it or read it for that matter. That's good, the though. Movie, the movie's coming out this summer. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> is that one of those things that's going to be a uh what is it called uh um was that bdsm movie book series 
going gray. Oh, no, Fifty Shades no. of Grey. <laughs> Fifty Shades of Grey. <laughs> this thing it's... is like, I mean, when I saw the movie for Joy Luck Club, I was like, oh my gosh, like, look at this. This is representation for somebody who's like me, like yeah, Chinese. I, I hear that a screen. lot from from Asian people. They, you don't feel represented represented by our media landscape. Yeah, generally. It's, yeah, it's it's like the last big one you can remember is Joy Luck Club, and now Crazy Rich Asians is coming out. There's a little bit more content coming in from Netflix, but like it's we're talking about capturing the Asian diaspora experience. Mm. We're talking about Asian Americans, not mm-hmm. you know like Chinese Chinese, but the ones that are living here. And yeah, that exactly, right? makes it more rare, yeah. You're born here, and you're raised here, and you're American, but you're looked at as other, regardless. Funny thing, I'm actually Canadian. Are you? I thought, oh, I thought Michigan, but I guess that, that light goes up in the Can- yeah. Canada as well. Yeah. <laughs> the thing is, I, I immigrated to Canada from the Philippines. So oh, English- okay. English isn't my first language or my second language. You, you speak Tagalog, Tagalog? What is it? Yep, Tagalog. Tagalog. Yeah. Tagalog. I speak Tagalog. that Tagalog. and uh, a dialect of Chinese, Fukien or Hokkien. And I mean, when I came to Canada, I couldn't really speak a lot of English. How old were you when you went, uh, moved to Canada? Nine. Nine years old. Yeah, and so I you learned. Came over, did not know a word of English. They threw you into a Canadian elementary school and said, "Sink or swim." Yeah, and then French class started, so you can see oh. how that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, you, so do you know French fluently, or did that work out like all school languages and kind of flitter away? I um, I'm semi fluent in French. That's cool. The funny thing is, for English, I learned English through watching the WWF in the Philippines. Really? Oh, wow. Interesting. Yes. So Hulk Hogan, Macho Man Randy Savage, and the Ultimate Warrior and Andre the Giant taught me English. <laughs> oh, you just dated yourself. There you go, 80s. <laughs> dated yourself. <laughs> Did you watch that cartoon? The WWF cartoon? I think Mr. T was in it, too. I haven't seen it. I only watched the... Oh. Uh, the thing is, in the Philippines at the time, it's not... We didn't have cable. So my dad would get these, I'm dating myself again, Betamax, <laughs> Betamax tapes. Oh, that yeah, had, I have to ask you how old you were for the one year that Betamax tapes were a thing. That and basically that's, I mean, was, it. was specific. Yeah. <laughs> but he, he'd get these tapes in and that's what we would watch because he loved wrestling. And then that's how I slowly like knew a little bit of English, but English is such a complicated language. <laughs> There's nuances. I mean, definitely, I spoke to a an Italian writer yesterday who tries to translate her novels into English herself, and she is an Italian. Like, she speaks only Italian and then other languages also. Yep. So, I mean, I can imagine translating her work into English is incredibly difficult, but the nuances of the language, I mean, they can really be hard to grasp. Um, do you have a connection to the Philippines still? Do you feel strongly Filipino or more Canadian? Culturally, my family is a little strange in that I'm Chinese Filipino. Uh-huh. So, you know, my my mom, I'd say this as a joke, my mom would jokingly switch heritages whenever it's convenient for her, meaning Chinese New Year. Where's my red envelope? Oh, you're Filipino. Or during a Filipino, um, a Filipino like a uh, rite of passage, which is like a big party when a girl turns eighteen. I'd ask her about it, and she's like, "No, you don't do that. We're Chinese." So it's a very interesting cultural upbringing. So you got the it's... best of both. Basically, you got yeah. to learn Chinese heritage. You got to learn Filipino heritage, yeah. and on top of that, now you know North American heritage. Yep. In a way, I mean, is there any heritage in Canada? I don't know. We don't have any down here. Oh, we, we do. do. It's, it's, <laughs> we do. It's called hockey and donuts. And <laughs> hockey poutine. And donuts. How do you feel about um that place? What's it called? Your your mainstay donut place. Tim Hortons. Yeah. Is that why Canadians love love donuts, or is it more because you actually make good donuts places? I go to the only Krispy Kreme location in Mississauga in Toronto. Once you go Krispy Kreme, you cannot go back. When that hot when that hot sign goes on, you gotta stop. I mean, it's incredibly indicative. I I bought a dozen 
hot Krispy Kreme donuts once and devoured them before I even got home. There's just like, nothing like you could see them being made. They're melting in your mouth. They really could. Yeah. They're ridiculous. Yeah. Tim Hortons, I've been there once. It disappointed me. I was it's, like, oh, I thought this was supposed to be good. And it turns out it's like Dunkin' Donuts or whatever. Or, yeah, I wouldn't. Know, just a corporate place. It's frozen. The problem is it's not It's not like you're spoiled with Krispy Kremes where you could see it being made fresh. Yeah. These are brought in like, you know, pre-made and stuff. So it's going to taste a little <laughs> bit different. We're talking about donuts. I uh, yeah. I lived out in Washington for a little bit and they have tons of little great independent donut shops like mom and pop places that make the best glazed donuts i've ever had in my life i mean there's just it i don't i know i don't know if uh, canada has dunkin donuts or not but they're the worst place ever to make ever to exist and they're everywhere i guess maybe no. tim hortons the same way no not up here for dunkin donuts nope it's all it's all tim's it's Horton. and it's everywhere right it's every corner every corner you can get a cappuccino from tim hortons i live in a town of three thousand people and there's oh, wow. one there's it one <laughs> everybody's worked there at least one time right yeah, Everybody there's two has. stoplights in my town and one Tim Hortons. So yeah, Tim Hortons yeah. and a Burger King because that's Canadian too, I guess now. Yeah, no Burger King anywhere nearby though. It's in Toronto. Uh, yeah, got you. How far away from uh, Toronto are you? Two hours. That's not terrible, right? Are you north of Toronto or? I'm near Lake Erie. West. Okay. So directly across from where Ohio. Is. Oh, oh, gotcha, man. God, how's the weather right there? Right there now is it freezing cold. It's still cool. There's still snow. <laughs> A little bit of snow on the ground. It's well, that's, that's normal, right? until July. Oh, it's unpleasant. Yeah, <sighs> that's horrible. Does how's your family treating you now that you are a? Uh, I mean, God, you're a successful author. You actually did it. How are they treating you? Like, oh, we were wrong after all this time. No, it's a typical Asian family of, oh, that's <clears> nice. <throat> what Good what for you, you. that's really nice. Because I think a lot, of, a lot of my family don't read. Like, they consume other forms of media, like TV and whatnot. So this is a little bit different. So this in this way though i can write somewhat about them and they will never know <laughs> they'll never know it'll be a big secret right in front of them between two covers on the coffee table this is a whole history of our family you guys will never know because you don't enjoy reading that's a sad thing about it. everybody nowadays isn't it reading yeah. is going bye yeah. bye. i actually thought about writing about my family and that we have um there's very like very interesting stories Definitely. Like, I can only trace back my family tree to my great-grandparents, and that's it. Um, like, great-grandparents in the Philippines or it's China? In China, because my great-grandfather on my mother's side was mm. adopted. Oh. His family was so poor in China. It, this is in the Xiamen and the Guangdong province, or in the sorry, Fujian province, and he was so poor that his dad ended up having to sell his siblings. My God, that's horrible. How much were they worth? I have no idea. All I know is that a Chinese family adopted him and brought him to the Philippines. Oh, so I don't know. Does it count? Do you call it ethn ethnically? Are you full-blooded Chinese then? Does it work mm -hmm. like that? Not really, because my grandmother on my father's side is full-blooded Filipino. Oh, okay, so the percentages just, just yeah. Get there's a definitely off. it's definitely mixed in in that my great grandmother, who's on my mother's side as well, she had bound feet. No, it's horrible. What a horrible yeah. custom. What a what a horrible custom. Because it made sense because I remember like when I visited her, she could she never ran. She always like walked delicate little steps right and it just it kind of like i clued into it when i was a little bit older where i'm like was there something wrong with you know tie ma's feet and my mom's like yeah she had bound feet i was like oh did she complain no 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 she didn't and then on my father's side my dad's um somewhere along the line somebody bought a dead man's name to immigrate to the philippines that's why you can't really trace it back farther than that. It's interesting. 
Yeah. What a great story. Just that alone, you know, stealing an identity to get into another country. It's right? really common though, isn't it? I, I would imagine. I mean, I, I, I picture my social security number being used in this country to, you know, fund somebody's cooking career in Chili's or something. I mean, it's not like they, it matters. It's not like there's a picture. It's not like they're going to check to make sure I'm not using it or there or whatever it happens. People have to work. People need to go wherever they need to go. Right. I mean, identity theft is pretty commonplace. Yep. Um, so yeah, his, I mean, that experience would be a magnificent story. Um, yeah, I mean, being from China as in, I mean, as in like Chinese heritage creates like interest, interesting conflict in terms of where you come from to this country, right? I mean, you go from very strict to what confusing mess, <laughs> what do you call well, what we have over here? I don't know. I mean, when I left when I left the Philippines, when my family, when my parents decided to leave, it was right, um, right after the Marcos regime happened. Oh yeah. Yep. So it went from there, and then they started over in uh, Canada, and over, as in like nothing. Well, something they brought. They were. I mean, to be fair, my parents were in the were bankers. Like they're not bankers, but they worked in the bank, so they weren't like completely without anything. They, yeah. They followed one family and then everybody moved here. And I kind of consider myself, I've always considered myself an immigrant, even though I've been here for a long time in Canada. I mean, it's just. How does Canada treat you in terms of being, uh, you know, a nine-year-old, basically a refugee from the Philippines, from from a dictator? Do they treat you like a Canadian now or like somebody who's uh, still an immigrant? Nope. Basically, I find that a lot of people's perceptions about that is based on your command of language, which I think to be very deceiving because when I meet somebody with an accent, I my immediate thought is, oh my goodness, you know at least one or more languages. Right. That is incredible. That is yeah. my first thought. Other That's people... interesting. I do think that this person that I'm talking to who's frustrating me because I can't understand where they're saying they're actually speaking a language that they're not familiar with that well or very custom or comfortable with. Yeah. And I don't speak any of the languages. I'm unfortunately very incapable of foreign language. I mean, I guess I know like the rudimentary is Spanish and some Italian and some French and some German, but yep. I could probably immerse myself in those countries and eventually learn, but I just don't have the opportunity here. I mean, Spanish people are basically forced to speak English. There's nobody around them going to let them speak Spanish. Yep. And the thing is, this is why it's so hard for me to write. Because the grammatical rules that I grew up with when I before I immigrated, right, is kind of indebted in me. Like, I, Tagalog and Chinese do not have tenses. <laughs> Interesting. I'm, does it, do you think it adds a flavor to your writing? that wouldn't be there otherwise um because i mean what uh, what i mean is you're coming from because I mean, you basically learn grammar intuitively as you speak and as you read if you experience the language that way and you're going to interpret those understandings in your own writing you might learn in school that there are rules but if you don't really apply those rules they just become something that lives on the side are you applying those rules or are you applying applying your understanding of the language? Um, I find that with that, like with the language, I'm still, you know, I've, it's more of, it's not so much the mechanics of the language. It's how I see or describe things or how I see the world because I'm an artist first. I write second yeah, art. That. Art came naturally to me. So the way that I write, I see writing as a way to paint with words. Ditto. I, I agree. That's the way I write as well. Just um, try to get as much detail as possible into a scene without making it bogged down. I mean, it's like a dance, right? I don't dance in real life, but I imagine that's what dancing is like. Light, you know, flowing, kind of prancing with the words. You don't yep. want to bog anybody down. Don't want to bore them. Don't want to step on anybody's toes. Like the best kind of writing to me is very concise, but evocative. And I know that for some people that might be a contradiction. Yeah. I mean, concise and evocative. Yep. I mean, you want 
things to incite you, right? But you want it to be what? Hemingway-ish? What do you mean by concise? I mean, that's an interesting term. Concise, as in if you can take one sentence to describe something versus taking three and be more effective, I'm more likely to do the one sentence. I would, oh, yeah. That's how I would approach it. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I definitely agree. One word as opposed to three words. Find the best term or phrase to, to, to say something. Yeah, that's really apt. And then, I don't know. I mean, can you teach it? Uh, did somebody my... came to you and, huh? If you well, have money. <laughs> <laughs> well, somebody's asked, one of my friends, my critique partners, when they read my work, they always say, your descriptions are so lush and they're just so vivid how do you like if i need if i need help with describing i would go to you what would huh. you how do you how can i make my descriptions better and how my, do you make your descriptions better the, my piece of advice would be use all of your senses don't be confined yeah, right? to don't visual be... so awesome there's sound live, that's what i would say more or less live your life get out there and then use all of your senses and experience and try to describe it how does it make you feel? I mean, be out there in the world, right? I mean, yeah. I was nine when I went to Germany or eight when I went to Germany and came back when I was like nine or 10. It's an amazing, ex I mean, you're able to experience, you know where you are and coming from a foreign, uh, you know, a home to foreign is amazing, especially why, being so different. Which hmm? is why I need to be in the location that I'm writing. What do you mean? I'm um, this one is set in San Francisco. I have uh -huh. been to San Francisco once uh -huh. and I've asked a friend of mine who lives in the area and what she did for me was she recorded a walk. This is better than street view. Uh -huh. She recorded a walk. So you got a bit of the sounds and she's been taking pictures. So she took pictures of Chinatown for me, of the graffiti, of everything. And yeah, she's definitely going to be in the acknowledgments, but that's one way for me to get the setting right. It's interesting. Why choose San Francisco over Toronto? Because San Francisco's Chinatown is the oldest in North America. It's older than New York City? Yeah. San Francisco's is the oldest and the very oldest Chinatown in the world happens to be in Manila, where I was close to where my family lived. It's interesting. Have you been to either? <laughs> you have been to San Francisco. Have you been to Manila? Um, that's where I was born. Oh, so you were very familiar with that Chinatown. Well, that's where my family. Yep, that's where my family that's... lived, and they had a business there. Wow, interesting. Have you been to the Chinatown down here and on Canal Street in Manhattan? I haven't. I've been to New York City once. I'm hoping maybe to go again if I have any book related events, though oh, I am a little bit apprehensive about traveling. Anywhere or just to New York City? Just uh, in general. <laughs> oh, I love travel. Travel is so much fun. In fact, professionally, I can't wait to travel for the writing. If that ever happens, that'd be wonderful. Um, but I mean, yeah, I mean, you might be invited to Comic Cons when you're. Your book goes double platinum, becomes a movie. Wouldn't that be crazy? I mean, you're sitting on that that position, right? You're with Penguin Berkeley, which is a name, right? I mean, an agent you have might send your book to somebody who makes movies, option that out, and then all of a sudden, you know, you're Peter Pan, not Peter Pan. Yeah, Peter Pan's author. What's his name? <laughs> Forever known. Yep, yeah, J.M. Right? Barry. I have a film agent for this film, uh, for this book. Do you really? Yes, I do. And how, that, how, how did that experience work out? From well, what happened was my book went into auction, which means more than two or more than one publisher wanted it. Uh -huh. And um, if your book goes into auction, it has, I think, a higher chance of snagging a film agent, but it's still nothing is guaranteed. A film agent, I think, is similar to a literary agent and that they take on whatever clients they want. And uh, my agent is at UTA, and I'm hoping, she, I think she's waiting for the manuscript to be done before she starts shopping it around. Would you be upset if Lucy Liu played your central character, your main character? No. 
I'm going to be completely grateful for everything as long as <laughs> it's not Scarlett Johansson. I'm good with it. Oh, that would be horrible. That would be such a slap in the face, wouldn't it? Uh, uh, so no, I like her. I like her yeah, and everything. Like just too. not for this role. Black Widow, yes. This yeah. role, not so much. What about for um, what was it called? Ghost in the Shell. I think that's where the comment originates from, isn't it? Yeah, I've seen the anime. I haven't seen the movie. Well, I know she takes over the role. It's an Asian role, and she's a white yeah. lady. So uh, created some consternation when it happened. Well, this is why, I mean, we're, we're coming full circle now to the whole representation, right? And how that's important. Do you think that you're representing your... Um, culture is it culture or ethnicity what do you want to call it i would call i'm fine with culture um i'm hoping because the thing is being chinese it's not a monolith it's very like there's so many different experiences and they're all valid yeah in my case i'm diaspora chinese and that you, it's like chinese filipino how many chinese filipinos do you know right what does diaspora mean it's uh, the migration of a people from one place to the other. In my case, it's from China. And then I have some of my relatives are in Taiwan before they landed into the Philippines. And then we moved from the Philippines to Canada. So you can see where the migrant or where the migration trail happened. That is fascinating. It's a history. I love, I'm a big fan of history. My wife is a uh, Korean descent. So she is a, uh, the daughter of two Korean War survivors as children. Um, but Korea is very isolated, so you don't really have a lot of this migration really happening, I guess. Right? I'm, I'm wrong, though, aren't I? Recently, the 20th century, Asian people have dispersed all over the place. Last time I visited the Philippines, there was a lot more Koreans there than there were when I was living there. Yeah, I was, that's why I changed my mind midway through my statement, because I started realizing I'm hearing a lot of different communities sprouting up. I mean, there's a Koreatown in Manhattan. There's one in Los Angeles. I mean, it just seems like, you know, countries are just getting up and moving, unfortunately. Fortunately for me, it's the food. I mean, this, <sighs> the book that I have, if you love food, I think you'll love it. Yeah, that's what I wanted to get into with you. I wanted to find out if you have a particular passion for, for the culinary arts. My father taught me how to cook. Oh, so what kind of cooking did your father do? He is, he is self, well, I would say kind of self-taught, but his mom taught him. Mm -hmm. And he's the one responsible for cooking meals in my house growing up. What did you eat as a child? Everything. Like my dad would, my dad wasn't restricted to just Filipino food or Chinese food. He would cook like everything. One time, I clearly recall this. It was, I think, New Year's, close to New Year's, and it was in Toronto. And he's like, oh, I'm hungry because we're w waiting for the countdown. And he said, go get the lamb chops out from the fridge. And he just took the lamb chops, put them on the, put them on the skillet, and cooked it with brandy, and that was it. Like, it was amazing. He just, he's like, this is, he does not use measurements, so, the, you know, sign of a true chef, right? Huh. What was your favorite thing eating? What was your favorite meal? Like if you could put that on the table or you could make it yourself and it always makes you happy. Meal. That's a tricky one. Or I don't know, dish. Make it more concise. I know, but the problem is I'm thinking about like 20 things and I'm trying <laughs> to narrow it into one. <laughs> Give me the first three that came to mind. First three that come to mind, what we would call, I guess, comfort food is... Oh, goodness gracious. Um, yeah, this because th my dad is just such a good cook. Uh, okay, there's this one dish called arroz caldo, mm -hmm. and it is a Filipino dish. And it's, do you know what congee is? I'm pretty sure your wife's made some. The rice yeah. porridge? Yeah. yeah. So this is Filipino style. This one has saffron, ginger, and chicken. So it's a really nice, comforting. She loves congee. She thinks it's comfort food. It is. Like in this case, this one is like a nice thick like congee for winter. Like a really, really good dish. And she shares your sentiments on that. The rice and the broth. It's very homey. Yep. Number two? 
Number two would be sake clams. Sake, like the wine, the rice yeah. wine? What you do is you take sake, you take ginger and a little bit of garlic, put it into the pot, get some cherry stone clams, uh -huh. put them in, and it's like this, it just comes out. It really complements the natural sweetness of the clams. Okay. Um, I think like mussels basically, except instead of wine and mussels, you're using clams and sake. Yeah. As for mussels, the dish that my dad, actually my uncle made that I really, I still make to this day is I get, I get them on the half shell. Uh huh. I put in minced garlic and Monterey Jack cheddar shredded over and bake them. So they're twi they're already cooked. You pry open the lid and cook them again. Yep, these ones are already pre-cooked, and then you just you put the garlic and you put the cheese and you put them on broil for about seven eight minutes, and they're done. And it's like this baked muscle thing. So what what does your character cook in the novel? Dumplings, the the traditional like what you think are comfort Chinese comfort food, like dumplings, noodles. Um, you know what I thought of when I was reading the description of your book is the um, the movie Eat, Drink, Man, Woman. Yep. The Ang Lee. That, that thing was uh, it's one of my favorite movies ever. Like, I love that thing. I love when he's cooking. The, the, the sequences are just beautifully done. Um, but I thought about that. It's like this. That's what made me mad. I was like, this is obvious. I should have done this. <laughs> that's what such that's what's that's why good ideas are so irritating because they're obvious, aren't they? Well, it is because food is like in many other cultures, like food is a way to bring people together, to bring right. your family together. And it's magical in a way. If you don't cook and somebody's cooking great food for you, you're like, how are you doing this? And there's some of your heart and soul in there, too. Like you're saying with your father, um, you know, your father lives at every single meal that you serve your family or your friends or whatnot yeah. forever, <laughs> whether you talk to him or not. My grandfather is in all types of stuff that I make, or actually my mom, you know? Yeah. It's very interesting. Family exists. There's history there. I mean, there's, it's amazing. I did a, I did a food blog for a year just to study the uh, cooking and food history and all that good stuff, the preparations. It was a fascinating journey. Definitely is. In my case, like my dad supplied his recipes into the book. As in the experience of cooking it with him, or he told you? He gave me his recipes. It will be in the book. Oh, interesting. Um, so you're Canadian, and we're not holding that against you because yep. we like Canada. Canada is a cool place. I've been there a few times, thankfully. I've never been to Mexico, though. I've never been to the Philippines or China. Um, but you have been to those other two places and my country. Are you pretty traveled? Have you been all over the place? Or is that pretty much the extent of your traveling experiences? Um, North America, a little bit of Asia. I'm hoping to finally step foot on in Europe next spring. Paris. Oh, good for you. Paris. Paris and London, yes. Oh, good for you. There, I've never been to either one of them, but I love Amsterdam and Italy. <laughs> um, I love Europe so much. You're going to have such a great time. Um, I need to bring my eating pants is what I need to bring. Oh, you're gonna eat. Uh, you're gonna eat a bunch of food. Fa uh, pra Paris is supposed to be fantastic if you're going for. That's what cooking. they said. The yeah. bread. I already have a list of like <laughs> Paris's top ten bakeries that somebody sent me. She's like, yeah. "You're gonna go here. Here's all the top ten bakeries," and I'm like writing it down. Where <laughs> is it? Um, and you said Paris and where? London. London, London yeah. is not a great eating town. I don't think. It's a great theater town though. Are you in the theater? Yes. Do you get an opportunity to see much up in your area? The last thing that I saw was Lion King. I'm waiting for Hamilton to get up here because it's supposed to be coming to Toronto sometime soon. I would love to see Hamilton. Um, yeah, and it's like 30 minutes away. Like they're probably getting ready right now to do a production, maybe. Do they do productions on Sunday or it was a matinee today? Who knows? It's irritating. Yeah, that'd be awesome. I've listened to that soundtrack so many times. Yep. Same. I've so never I've seen, seen I've not seen Lion King either. I don't know if I'm interested. 
I took it to see. I took it for we watched it for my kid. And the worst part was that I love her. She's she's still pretty young. Uh-huh. Yeah. During my favorite song of the thing, like when you you know, can you feel the love tonight? That when that was coming on, she's like, Mommy, I have to pee. <laughs> How old is she? She's eight now, but at the time oh. she was like I think she was six and I'm like do not drink anything child do not drink anything and she didn't but she's like yeah mommy I have to pee I was you like lean oh, in and say it's no. tough. <laughs> oh man that theater is huge too I've never been in it I've been by it a bunch of times but I've never been inside it looks gigantic it looks so big so I've seen that I've seen Les Mis I've seen I wanted to see Miss Saigon but I, I missed it but that's gone right yeah, I remember I, that back when I was a kid. I watched there's a um there's an obviously there's a cinematic version of it. It's not bad. It, probably, it doesn't give you the same effect. I mean, there's there's something about being in the audience of a theater that's kind of magical. It is. It's the music, the live music. You have an orchestra, the power, the force of that music, and it's just spellbinding. For me, as being those people on stage. I mean, it's just so. I've been there before. I've been on stage in a play and you know you're barely memorized on your lines and you've got to perform in front of all these people and it's like it's electric you feel your your face is on fire i mean you're basically you know it's just, it's just the most anxiety i've ever had in my life was being on a stage that's what i feel as those people so in the moment it's also a filipino thing i think you know like there's a the filipinos love karaoke no, I think that is an Asian thing, isn't it? Yeah, so it's an overall Asian thing, but Filipinos take it to like the next level because How I so? remember. Well, oh, I just sing. thought of something I want to ask you. I was at a birthday party not too long ago for a Filipino couple. They're American, but their families are from the Philippines, or maybe they, in fact, they are. I'm not quite sure 100%, but um, they t put on some regular music, some regular pop music, and they started line dancing to it. Oh, like, yeah, yep. What's yep. up with that? Line dancing is a common, <laughs> it really is a common thing. There's so many people I know. If you go to Filipino parties, you can see line dancing. It's just. Yeah. I was like, dude, where where are we? We're in the Bronx. Why are they doing line dancing? It was crazy. I was so, I, was, I mean, it was wonderful. Why? I mean, it wasn't, it was one person. And then the whole group of people got yep. up and started doing it. I was like, whoa, startling. That's startling. Do you line dance? No, <laughs> you don't mind dance. Oh, I have no rhythm. I have no rhythm, and I don't sing either. I like watching other people sing. You don't but... do the karaoke singing either. I don't think I could do that either. Yeah, too much I... judgment. For me, for karaoke, I you want to be. Do you want attention? Right? I mean, who wants attention like that? Isn't it unfortunate that you're an artist because now you've got center stage, don't you? Whether you I'm, want it or not, your art has dictated you get this position where now you have all eyes on. Thankfully, I am a functioning introvert. <laughs> what does that mean? Oh, yeah, I got you. Meaning that in the moment, you can be more than what you need to be. Meaning that, yeah, and if you meet me in person, you would assume that I am an extrovert, but you don't see me, you know, a day later still sequestered in a hut trying to recover from <laughs> in interaction. Gotcha. I'm the same exact way. I'm okay one time. But if you come back around trying to have another conversation with me, I'm probably not going to be as friendly. <laughs> you know what I mean? I am okay one time. Um, yeah. So you cook, you write, you play music. I was tortured with organ lessons when I was younger. It's random, say right? Organ? Yeah. Well, are, are you is that a church thing? No, this is a Chinese thing of picking a musical instrument and I just did not I could do it. I could function. I could, you know, I know. I still know how to read sheet music. It's just uh -huh. I've been begging my parents for art lessons and they keep cramming piano or organ until they realize that it just wasn't sinking in. The organ, do you still know the organ? No. 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 That, I mean, that is definitely a very church-oriented instrument. Mm -hmm. Which is also, again, Filipino. Filipinos are, most Filipinos are Catholic. It's a big Catholic thing, right? So that's another thing I grew up with, that the Catholic upbringing. So you brought up, you brought up Catholic. Do you still practice? Yeah. Or what, I don't think I'm I, I, grew, I grew up Catholic, too. 
I'd say I'm old. <laughs> this guy, the Pope like, they have over there in Rome is not bad, right? I mean... <laughs> yeah, like, he's great, but there's a lot to make up for. <laughs> yeah. It's not a great situation, that's, is that's it? That's the issue to have. No. But, I mean, they're heading into the right direction, and if you do want to join the Catholic Church, now's the time they're not being picky. What would... Oh, they're not being picky. So I could yeah, they're... make an all the bad stuff I said about their beliefs. They'll just watch. Eh, don't worry about it. We don't even care if you believe anymore. You don't have to say anything. Just sit in church. Give us money. Pay our bills for us. You'll be all right. Yep. It's crazy. Um, does it, does religion play into your writing at all? No. No. If anything, I grew up more agnostic. Your family kind of raised you to question and kind of fill in the blanks as you see the information appear in front of you. You no, that's me. that's just me. That's just an internal, uh, like a personal. I'm the one who's questioning everything. Why is it like this? Destroy the patriarchy, stuff like that. But that would be me. <laughs> Destroy the patriarchy. Um, yeah, I guess. I mean, it would be a better world if I don't know. How do you? How do you? How would? What would you, how would you destroy the patriarchy? And what would you replace it with? I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to have time to think up of it. <laughs> think of what think of what um you would do? Yeah, because I've got deadlines now and whatever yeah. world domination plans or any kind of any great, you know, anything now, that I thought of and wanted to do, I I've got deadlines. I got to get stuff done. <laughs> you're, you're a public figure. You got to be careful what you say. Apparently, yep. If you are a famous person now, like people are going to come to you and ask for autographs and can I take my picture with you? Quick, quick. <laughs> I, I would not be, I'm a shy person, so uh -huh. that would all be very um, new. You know what I've noticed though, on this podcast, I do get a glimpse of some of the people that I talk to and, you know, they're, they're, they have their photo on their Twitter and then I'll see them on the camera and it look, they look nothing like each other. So I turned the camera off. I turned I the camera off because I'm in the basement and my basement is unfinished and I don't oh, want really? you to see what is going on. <laughs> I'm in my basement too. It's almost finished and my wife uses it as a freaking storage facility for all the stuff that she buys on sale. So it's it's absolutely horrible. Um, what was I saying? I was talking about your being famous and taking pictures and author yep. photos, not looking like real yep. life people. Yep. So basically that's what you do. I mean, you just take a really good author photo and nobody will know. You'll just be invisible. <laughs> I wrote that book. No, you didn't. I mean, that's, that's the best part about being an author, isn't it? Like compared to other, compared to other pursuits, like a musician or right. somebody who's on camera. Actor, exactly. yeah. They have their, their face time right now. It's all about your writing. You are, you are, your anonymity is protected, which I do enjoy. I enjoy that it's just my voice and my writing and that's out there in the world. And my questions, I don't have to worry about how I look. I mean, it would be great if I was able to perform on camera, you know, turn the camera on and be like a YouTuber or something. Yeah. Can't do it. I think too much. <laughs> you see it in my eyes constantly working out something. Doesn't play very well live. What is, um, what is your require? What do they require of you? For for like the writing, or do you have to do anything between now and then? Are you supposed to sit tight and not do any writing between now and when they want the second one, or when the rewrites come back? I am drafting book two while I wait for notes on book one, <laughs> so I'm I'm busy. Like I I'm trying to maximize my time. Oh, good for you. So, what's your plan after book two? Um. I have the synopsis and the idea for the option, but I have to work that one out still. I mean, I'm, at least I have the luxury of waiting because it won't be until next year. I think next summer where I'd have to think about that. Meaning next two. summer is when you turn book two in and then you're free. Yeah, book two in and then the option if it's done and yeah. And then it would be like it's this cyclical thing that once you once you have a book out, you still have to go on submission and then it's yeah, it's like a never ending submission. 
get a deal. Hopefully the good the good cycle versus the end of the cycle. Did you pitch this as a sequel as a series? It's not. The two books are not sequels. Good for you. Good for you. I'm that's awesome. Honestly, I'm like I'm living in a world where everything has a sequel, and I'm like, huh. I love things that stand alone. Where this is my story, enjoy it, and I'm gonna write another one, and that's gonna be my story. Yeah, because I think for me, I they're all standalones. I I thought about writing a fantasy series at one point, but right now I'm sticking to my brand, which is apparently food and magic. <laughs> you, can, you can veer off of that. I mean, especially you could develop a pen name and, and publish those romantic uh, romances that you have hidden away. And you know what would really be crazy is you're actually professionally, traditionally published and you publish those high school romances and they become hot and you become a millionaire off them. Those manuscripts are buried in the deepest spider hole in Canada <laughs> and nobody is going to get at them. You say that, but Anne Rice published all of her stuff too. I imagine one day you'll be like, oh, how about all this stuff? And No, no. I may actually light a bonfire this summer <laughs> just to make sure that the only remaining paper copies of them are gone. Oh, you're proud of them. That's why you still have them. You haven't tucked away because you're secretly very proud of the effort. I'm actually proud of your effort because, I mean, as far as like me in high school, I wasn't writing anything novel length. I mean, I was barely getting out of those little marble journals. You know what I mean? Yeah. What are they? I can't remember what they were called, though. They had a particular name on them. But anyway, I lost so many of those things. All of my childhood writing is gone. I don't even know what I was writing about soldiers and guns and stuff. But I mean, you wrote a novel. That's pretty damn cool. Um, so, I mean, we're about at 50 minutes right now. And uh, I don't know, I kind of wind things down at this point. But what do you, um, I mean, what do you think? Does it change anything? Does it make you want to work harder or does it make you want to work less? Getting to the pinnacle. Getting I'm actually not changing anything. I just, I've always had stories in my head. My, I was, yeah. my grandmother, my grandmother in the Philippines would tell me all of these Filipino folk tales. Oh, that's so cool. She's the one who inspired the writing. Man, I would get on like a Neil Gaiman type situation and write all the, the, the filipino folklore stuff down i think that's a country that doesn't really get a lot of respect in terms of their mythology it's the it's again it's the representation think about it there is there's not a lot of us how many Fil filipinos are out, are out there do you think do you know a number no all i know is i think what's the population now i haven't even googled but the last time i checked maybe 80 million you know manila is huge like it's yeah. it's got it's got like what Eight it figures was, of people in it. It used to be when I left it. It used to be around twelve million. Yeah, I thought about. I was thinking about twenty million. So I mean, it's like it's almost half of the the population of the Philippines, basically. Almost yeah. live in that metropolitan area, I bet. And it's bad, isn't it? I mean, that's what I hear, and then I hear the opposite too. Like it's not bad. It's it's bad in how it's being run right now. Yeah, this guy is not good. No. <laughs> the the president of the United States loves him. That's yeah, him. yeah, I think they're buddies. I think they have each other on uh, FaceTime, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> it's weird. You know, for most of my life, we've been calling other countries the axis of evil. It's weird how now we're part of the axis of evil. I don't know how that happened. Um, it's kind of odd. I mean, the thing is... I live in my country. Yes, we have the haughty prime minister. I was going to say, you have that ski guy. <laughs> I mean, I, it's, there's still, I mean, we still have problems up here too. We do. We have problems up here too. Like the indigenous people are not being treated well. Anywhere. Here. Yeah. And they're not being treated well down here either. We ran, a, uh, we, we ran a pipeline through their freaking ancestral lands and then it sprung a leak and we don't seem to care. Yep. I mean, yeah. Anyway, it's really it's, bad up here in Canada, and I mean, Indigenous women are being murdered. And I was going to say the rape rate among Indigenous women is crazy in Canada, right? Yeah. It's it's just the situation is bad, and it's like I said, yes, you know, healthcare, all of that. It's 
great. I'm thankful for what is working, but there's certainly a lot I can do to make it better. Anywhere, but I mean, yeah, Canada's awesome. I love it. I, when I went, it was like, I want to move to Montreal and live there. It's the most European city in North America, I think. Um, Quebec City? Uh, Montreal. You should go to Quebec City. Oh, is it better? Why is if it better? If you're thinking of, been to Europe, right? Yeah. We're talking about tiny little cobblestone, like streets and stuff, that, that kind of a feel to it. That's what Quebec City is. And if you're going to go, I suggest you go in the wintertime during Carnival. In the wintertime? Yes, they have like this beautiful winter festival. We went in for the Ice Hotel as well. Are you talking about like for Lent? We're like that, uh, uh, Wednesday and then? No, this is January to February. Okay. Early. If you want, the Ice Hotel will be up and running. Oh, it's a pretty cool place. They've got a bar completely made out of ice. Even the shot glasses are made of ice. That's cool. Um, we went a few, like, before our kids were born, so it was like four years ago, to Montreal in the wintertime. I thought it was wonderful. It was empty. You know, they had just snowed, so there's like, feet of snow on the sidewalks. Um, it was really nice. But, yeah, I'll check out Quebec, Quebec City if I can get, convince my wife to take another trip. If you have children, they will love it. Yeah, and maybe they'll be old enough next year. You put them in the – just it. make sure you have your snowsuits on because it's hella cold. But they've got um, – it's it's just they have all these winter games and everything. It's just an outdoor carnival. You say this word snowsuit like everybody's supposed to have one or something. Yep. I don't, I don't, I don't want a snowsuit. <laughs> if you care about your tender bits, every single part of your body, you need a snowsuit. <laughs> tender bits. Do you go skiing? Are you a skier? Are you an ice skater? No. No, no either no, one? No. no. Okay. I'm not really an outdoor person because... (laughs) Oh, you're a writer. That makes sense. Just sit at your desk and not do anything but write. The only tan I'm getting is from the laptop screen, basically. (laughs) Yeah, well, also you live in a... What kind of... Can you describe the town that you're living in? Is it like mountainous, wildernessy, or is it more... Farm country. Farm country. So it's really not a lot. Yeah, meeting in two weeks, it's going to smell like something... Yeah, I got you. Um, because of the manure or whatever. Yeah, it's late this year because everything's been frozen. We just had an ice storm about a week ago. I got the snow tires out right before the ice storm hit. And yeah, the fields are, it's going to be, I kind of feel bad for the farmers in the area because it's going to be a late season. Like it's, it should have been, everything should have been started by now. Yeah, I've got a feeling we're not going to really have a spring. We're going to just jump right into horrible, hot humidity. It's going to be horrible. They're not going to have any hay. They're not going to be able to grow any grass. Yeah, that's why in Canada, there's two There's two seasons. It's winter and summer. Oh, yeah. Everything's at least starting to turn alive now. And leaves are, cherry blossoms are going like crazy. Um, Man, so you're going to be doing a lot of these podcast and getting out there and interviewing and putting yourself in the public eye yeah it's exciting man i'm jealous i'm I'm happy that it's uh i'm happy that i got to talk to you so new newly into your journey uh, it's uh obviously this is what everybody does it for right i mean the opportunity to get their work under people's eyes um yeah. and it may or may not come with a paycheck but at least you're telling your story in a way that is compelling enough somebody wants to say bring it to me and you know i mean we never really talked about it but i guess we can the pitch idea that you sold it on i mean you had had written the novel and then you wrote the pitch right and then you sold that pitch on twitter yep tell me about the experience from from the twitter aspects of basically you won a, a tweet contest right 140 characters yeah, it and was sold one. your novel idea, hmm? and it was 120 when I did it. <laughs> oh, 120. It wasn't 140. It was 120. I no, it was, it was. Yeah, it was 120. It was the pre-extra character days. Yeah, it was. Um, when I did do it, I wasn't even sure if I wanted to do the contest until that morning, where a friend of mine said, "Why aren't you doing it here? I'll help you." And I reworked a couple of pitches. I sent one out, and it 
kind of it blew my mind in that it got over a hundred and fifty likes. Like, and it was from... just a pitch, like you just yeah. wrote out a pitch and then hashtag yeah. pitch wars and sent it on in and Yeah, the D V pit one, yeah. And it's like agents agents liked it, other editors boosted it. Editors from the industry. What was it? Do you remember the 120 characters? Um, yeah, I think I told you. It's uh, Chocolat meets Big Fish when a woman returns to returns to town to inherit the family restaurant and its secrets. And there's not even one single mention of ethnicity in that. Well, the Chinatown. I put oh, it Chinatown. in. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I also added in the hashtag of own as in own voices. Interesting. Is that yeah. a thing? I've never heard of that. Well, it's it's a very complicated term for some people. Like for me, it's I, I used it because this is me, like I'm Chinese and I wrote a Chinese, a very Chinese novel. I mean, one of the things that I was worried about too when I wrote this novel is that I wrote a very Chinese novel. Is it going to sell? Or am I going to run into a case where somebody says, oh, I'm sorry, I, I already have a Chinese author. I don't need to sign another one. Or I don't, we already have a Chinese book. But you didn't. You ran into the opposite of, please, write your Chinese story. Yeah. It's fascinating. And obviously, you're contracted for another book. Is there been a request that you continue writing from the same voice? The, from um, the same perspective yep it's all it's all the same it's about chinese people and food and magic and magic yeah but different characters completely yeah different characters it seems it's like it's i mean from what from what i've read when you're starting out you want to obviously build the brand right yeah and that's staying you know trying to build an audience trying to build fans and Yes, this is what I'm sticking with food. Like if you look at my website, there's a section in there that says, what have I eaten lately? Uh -huh. And I think you'll like it because there's some really beautiful food pictures that I've taken myself because okay. I, that's awesome. Yeah. I am the insufferable one who makes my family wait. And it's like, no, don't touch anything. I'm not done. I need to take pictures. <laughs> yeah. I always remember like when I'm almost done, I take some pictures of what's remaining. It's like, okay, it was pretty. Yeah. Um, so what if the book sells millions of copies and people are clamoring for that character to return, for that world to return? Would you be happily able to dance right back into it or would you do it begrudgingly? It depends on what, if I can think of a good enough story that would satisfy readers. I don't, I don't want to serve something up that I think that they would just like be for the sake of doing that if the story is there if the plot is there then I would do it regardless that you can make millions of dollars I it's it's it would like be the this... Harry Potter of Canada <laughs> 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 uh, but like I mean it's it's if you were if you were a fan would you would you want the fan service or would you want like your okay i'm not gonna take like grm's approach and that'll take forever i don't think right. i could do that but well i mean yeah. GR, i mean um that dude he kind of got lucky at the later part of his career kind of in a way i mean he's been working on that for like 20 years now 23 years that whole novel collection I and mean, that's a long time for eight books or seven books or whatever it's going to end up being I just know too many of his fans who've been like very disgruntled and that's not what I would want if I have fans. <laughs> uh, I'm one of those people that discovered HBO. So I mean, I didn't even read his books until after I'd already seen the series. Unfortunately, because I really enjoyed his books, I probably would have loved the series. Um, did you, did you like it? Did you I, it? I only saw the, f I haven't read it. Okay. Because it's, I, I tried, like, I think it's good. It's just not like, I'm more of a Neil Gaiman reading chick than I am for high fantasy. Uh, I love Neil Gaiman's um, American Gods. I thought that was oh, so yes. fantastic. That's, that is excellent, and I can't wait for season two. 
Oh, the I was going to say the book is one of my favorite books, and yep. the series did a really great job yep. of kind of making that. I wanted Dwayne the Rock Johnson to be Shadow, and the guy they got to play him is so Dwayne the Rock Johnson. It's so perfect. It's really great. Um, I think they're doing a really good job for that that series. Um, it's coming back, I would imagine, soon. It is. It's coming back soon. It's just a matter of whether Jillian is going to come back for her role. Jillian mm-hmm. Anderson? Yep. I didn't know she was in it. Who she play? Media. She plays media. I don't remember. <laughs> I'd have to be refreshed. I think it's been over a year. They haven't even started filming it yet, huh? I think they've started. The problem is the showrunners. I think they have different showrunners now. And oh, Neil Gaiman ra- ran it last season, I think. I but yeah, think I think it, it I was remember. Brian. I believe it's Brian Fuller, and I don't think he's running it. For season two. Oh, it was Brian Fuller, and now yep. it's somebody else. Yep. I know Neil Gaiman is running something, and it might be for Good Omens or whatever that is. Oh yes, and that's also being produced, and I can't wait for that as well. Yeah. Um, but speaking of series, I mean, Harry Potter was amazing. Can you imagine if? Uh, that, I mean, I don't really read a lot of series, but that was one of the ones that I could not wait for the next book to come out of. And uh, can you imagine if she had just stopped after the first one? Oh well, yeah, I mean. From what she said, we all know her story, right? Like, Mm -hmm. it had to be, I think, the publisher's daughter that said, hey, this is really good. Can you take a chance on this? It's This is why publishing is such an interesting business. Right. I mean, I've heard story. I didn't hear that, actually, that it was a publisher's daughter. Or maybe I had, but it didn't, you know, click. I had heard that, um, you know, other publishers had, you know, kicked her book out and published some reality TV stars memoirs or something (laughs) i mean it's just like they think they know what they're doing but nobody really does it's it's all all about luck and timing right i mean we talked about that earlier and when you wrote your novel you weren't like finished typing the end because i know you did that the last page you typed the end and uh shipped it off to your publisher you didn't think it was gonna get published did you uh no i i had no idea like the when it when that news dropped and said, hey, you're going to be published, you're like, what? <laughs> really? Yeah, it's a little bit different in that I went um, I went on submission. That's when your agent shops your manuscript around to other publishers. Uh-huh. She's the she's the one shopping it around. And yeah, it's I so mean, and, right? I mean, I, I wrote a novel and tried to get an agent and it did not work out at all. It was very frustrating and incredibly um, unrewarding. So, I mean, like in terms of your effort, you expect everybody to be jumping on and like, oh, I'll help you sell it. But that's actually what they're doing. I mean, that's their job is to take something that you wrote, feel strongly enough about it to sell it to people who need to feel strongly about it as well. I mean, to put into context, when I got my first agent, I had 120 rejections on that manuscript before she offered and agent that, rejections yep and you never considered going to small publishers i had um for another manuscript i had an offer from a smaller publisher and but, said no yeah i said you know why because i looked at i looked at like here it is immigrant girl looked at mount everest and said i want big five you know, I want the the whole thing. Interesting. And you I know, said that. I said that to myself. I said, I know it's going to take me a long time, and this is going to be really, really difficult. Because, I mean, a lot of people, I, um, I think, I mean, a lot of people say, here's my novel world, and they independently publish it. But you said, I want to write a phenomenal write novel, and I want it to be traditionally published. And if I don't get traditionally published, I will just be the best whatever I do in my small little town person in the world and I don't have to publish anything. It's not good enough. It is. It's just, that was my, that was my goal. And I knew it was going to take a long time because traditionally being traditionally published is the hardest one, the hardest road you can pick. Yeah. I mean, Penguin Berkeley sounds pretty impressive. (laughs) Is it? I mean, I don't know. (laughs) Maybe I should know that stuff. How much research did you do going into it? Did you know Penguin Berkeley was before the offer was made? Um, Yeah, because my agent was giving me uh, call sheets before I spoke to about six editors before the auction happened. 
Uh huh. And before each call, I get like I'd get the research sheet of what types of titles they published and all of that, and it gave me a lot of information on so each. You would, editor. you would talk to the editor. Yep. And you would go. You would understand what they were working on individually or have worked on in the past. Yep. What they've acquired and. It gives a good idea of what they're like, and then when you speak with them on the phone, you get a good you get a good feel of how they edit and what their vision is for your book. But at that point, though, you're still trying to sell them. Yep. You're still trying to kind of present yourself and your book as a package. I'm going to be one, easy to work with. And yes, two... exactly. It's a mutual <laughs> job. Inter- it is. It's a mutual job interview. Yeah. It's interesting, right? I mean, how do you do that? That's so complicated. Were you coached before going into the situation? Well, just I just kind of wing it and just be yourself. I mean, I guess that's important, right? Well, if when you have a kid, you learn not to <laughs> you learn to act like an adult on the whole. So it helps a little bit, right? Like I'm obviously talking tongue in cheek about like, you know, what you should be talking about and how to be a bit more professional. It's just that it's just making sure that when they're talking to you, they, you know, they see you as somebody who works very hard, who loves what they do. And it's not like one really kind of serial killer from CSI kind of thing. Yeah, I guess. I mean, you definitely don't want to come off as a serial killer from CSI. Yeah. That would be horrible. Do you know who Will Wheaton is? Yes. <laughs> Did you say yes? Shut up, Wesley. Yes. <laughs> yeah, shut up, Wesley. Um, I'm a fan. I love that guy. I follow him on Twitter or whatever. And his uh, on his webpage, he posted a, an episode of a show that he did where he plays a serial killer. And the guy played a serial killer so well. It is, it's actually really scary to think of him as a serial killer. Wesley. Yep. Anyway, I don't know why I mentioned that story. There must have been a point, but now I don't remember what it was. Uh, but now we are well over an hour. And I've got to say, thank you so much again for doing this with me today. Um, this was so cool that, you know, not only did you successfully publish your novel, but you still decided to be on my little tiny podcast. Um, I I loved your podcast. I listened to them. You have a very awesome like, conversational style. Oh, thank you. I that's appreciate why, that. That's why I agreed to be on it. And thank well, you for um, open invitation. Anytime you want to come back on, just let me know. Um, I, I won't actually, I finish up these podcasts with uh, three questions and man, I got to know what you would tell somebody who is striving to do what you've done. I mean, can you say anything to motivate them? Can you say anything to inspire them? Would you, or would you tell them, give it up? <laughs> I would just say like, don't don't give up i you know like know what you want just keep going at it hopefully luck will be on your side i i i knew going in this wasn't this was going to be extremely difficult for me with you know having like i know my grammar isn't perfect either who's this but it's just it's that you just have to you have to keep going you find you have to find your support system people you trust people who will be there for you when you just want to throw your hands up and give up but they know that you're passionate that you have it that you, that they will collect you and say you've got this keep going and it's not about inspiration is it i mean you didn't wait at your desk in front of your computer getting your suntan in front of your you know laptop monitor waiting for the inspiration to strike i mean did you have a word count that you reached for every day now that i'm drafting i've got i think it's loosely 1200 to 1500 maybe 2000 if i'm lucky if i'm ha- you know if i'm having a really good day but you don't wait for inspiration is what i'm saying or what i'm asking really i mean you're you're going in the into it with a task in mind accomplish accomplish yep. accomplish Yep, that's the stubborn in me that just sits down and goes, okay, you got to get this done. I don't know what you have to do, just get it done. Well, what amazes me, I mean, I definitely appreciate the hard work effort and not giving up. But what really impresses me about your story is the seven novels that you wrote and just have. I mean, that's pretty impressive. I mean, we're talking like at least 40,000 words a piece <laughs> times eight. And it's the really... first one, the first one, I think, was 60. 
So, I mean, these are impressive lengths of, of effort and they're just, in your it's opinion, sort of, not I mean, that's just amazing. I mean, it speaks volumes about your personality. It's sort of like that 10,000 hour kind of theory thing where you have to go through all that garbage to get to the point, you know, like you have to just learn it. You have to get that out of your system until you can get better. I mean, my goal is with each draft that I write and I still have goals that I will eliminate or work on the weaknesses that I've identified in the previous draft. And in terms of effort, I mean, how much education did you give, you, give yourself about craft? I mean, we talk about grammar, but we also have story and we also have character and all that other stuff. Did you educate yourself or is this a natural gift that you have? Oh, I went to school for humanities and history. Oh, okay. So you got a degree. So, I mean, the writing is just part of that. Yeah. And I was like, okay, I don't have a job in my field. I'm going to try to see if I can write oh. a novel per course that I have so I can justify that university education. <laughs> <laughs> Why didn't you go down to Humanities or Us and just get a job as like a humanities clerk or something? Yeah, it's a little, it's a little <laughs> hard. It's like, it's kind of like with your liberal arts degree, you yeah. use it to do something else. Either you go into teaching or law or what the so next you step do, is. Or you do what you're doing. I mean, I got my degree in English. So, I mean, there aren't many places. You can go anywhere is what they tell you while you're getting a degree. You yep. can be a garbage man if you want. But you're not going to be a garbage man. You got your degree in creative writing in the humanities because you like the arts. I mean, you want to create something. I you wanted to do creation. I actually wanted to do creative writing, but I realized that fourth year out of my five years. And I'm like, I am not going to be in school forever. <laughs> I got really lucky. I got really lucky. My freshman year... I was just looking through the course catalog and CRW is what the abbreviation is down here or in Florida, actually. And I was just absentmindedly reading the description like the first week of class and it said writing workshop. I was like, bunk, I signed up. And then from there, I signed up for every single creative writing workshop there was and accidentally got a degree in creative writing. <laughs> did you have to um, audition for it? Because we did for my program. I think BFAs, like Bachelors of Fine Arts, you would have to submit work to prove that you were capable of some. I mean, I worked with some people in workshops who were not worth the effort. I mean, they'd submit a story that they wrote the night before because they were lazy or stoned or whatever the hell. Um, so, I mean, it was really frustrating because you weren't dealing with quality. But I imagine for like a BFA, you would have to audition. And definitely for like a Master's of Fine Arts or a Master's degree, you would have to work sample. Did I lose you? Nope, I'm here. Oh. <laughs> I got quiet there for a second. Um, yeah, so no, I did not have to audition. I don't think I auditioned. I might have sent something in. I think I sent something in. Why? Did, what did you do? I had to send in a writing sample to see if I could even take the course. <clears throat> oh, excuse me. That was nice and rude. Um, maybe I did too. Maybe I had to send an email. I mean, who knows? They didn't tell me no, <laughs> so it didn't matter. And I wasn't stressed out about it, so I must have had a good good sample. Um, I don't know. Did you send a sample? I did. And? I did get in, but the it's... Good, uh... You know the best story would have been, they told me no. Oh, no, 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 no. I got <laughs> one of this... Right? I mean, no, think about it, though. If they said no... You're not good enough, and then all of a sudden, you know, you're a best-selling author. One of the agent rejections that I got uh -huh. said I should go take a writing course. <laughs> Did you? Those that's words. That's like a personalized response, though. That's so like that you one, look for that in the, in the rejection letter thing. I guess. No, it is like that was one of the harshest rejections that I got. Basically, the agent told me to go take a writing course. Any specifics, though? Did he tell you why? Uh, all I know is for my mental health, I'm just going to try to look forward and not. Yeah. It's, it's, it's like hard I... to dwell. I mean, it's hard not to dwell, isn't it? I mean, you hear something and you're like, please let there be something positive. Yeah. You know, I just spent like a week on this or something. I'd like to hear something that's good. Cause I'm not of... one of those. I'm not one of those people who operate with a chip on their shoulder. What do you mean? You know how some people operate with the chip on their shoulders and they use it to motivate them to prove their critics wrong or wrong to try their, that their way. inner monologue wrong or even their critics. They're just, <laughs> it's like if the world's against me, I'm going to use that as fuel to succeed. 
And so what you're saying is that you have a really good sense of self. Yes and no, like writing, writing is definitely like a pitfall of mental health issues as well. Too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was like, man, if you're able to get through this whole process without having like hiccups, like I said, you know, you're writing a story, it takes a week. And the entire time you're filled with doubt. Yep. Filled with doubt because doubt, you know, anxiety. I don't know how to write anymore. I've lost, I've lost the ability. What's the dialogue? How do people sound when they talk? Oh my God, this description is so freaking long and I'm not even getting to the point. I suck at writing. I'm giving it up completely. And then like on Thursday, it all falls into place. Yep. <laughs> it's like, oh shit. It's a 6,000 word story and it's done. Yep. And, and that's the best part when you get it. You know what I mean? The worst part's when you first that first that put that first line on the paper and try to find it. Why are we talking about this? We're talking about your sense of self. Yes, I think you're on question my, number two. My my sense of self got got out of hand. Um, my second question is really easy, actually. Um, what are you reading? Right now, I have a ton of books on my TBR, and they're mostly YA. Are you? Is your book YA? No, it's no. adult. Why do you like YA as a because the community, the community that I'm, you know, the Twitter community, a lot of my friends write YA. That is true. I mean, I don't know about your friends, but there are a lot of YA authors out there. The last one that I really, really liked was uh, Reign of the Fallen by Sarah Glenn Marsh. It's a fantasy. Uh -huh. and, and Beasts Made of Night by Toche Onyebuchi. Both great fantasy. It's a very nice name. Novels. I like that a lot. She's Asian. They are Asian. I, Sarah is white. I think Tochi is, I'm not sure. It sounds so Japanese. <laughs> Actually, not Japanese. He's. I think he might be African. I think. Oh, interesting. I'm just not sure. But it's a beautiful. It's a beautiful novel that he wrote. I, I like. I like the fact that we're starting to see a lot more unique voices in publishing. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's really fascinating. Um, I'm. I'm so happy that it's, things are being diversified. Um, it makes reading so much more fun, right? I mean, you never know what you're gonna get. Yep. Um. Anything else recommending? Oh, so many books. Um, <laughs> if you think of anything, shoot me an email. I'll put them in the notes 100%. Well, the thing that I would recommend, though, is more of a watching thing. Chef's hmm. Table. Chef's Table oh. on Netflix. Oh, you like it? My wife that loves one. it. My and... wife loves anything with food in it. She will watch it endlessly on, on Netflix. There is a really cute Chinese film on Netflix called This Is Not What I Expected. It's subtitled, but it's a foodie film. I think both of you would like that. Okay. This is not what I expected. Yes. Okay. Um, well, thank you so much. And uh, my last question is, where can people locate you? Um, actually, I guess I have four questions. When's your book coming out again? It's uh, next summer. Next summer of 2019. Hardcore. Do you know a date or the old be figuring that out later on still figuring it out but the title for now i don't think it's changing is natalie tan's book of luck and fortune it's, i hate you so much you know that it's such a good title it's such a good idea it's such but a it's that, that title was thought up of like the night before the day before we had to go on submission because the, the title that i had before that wasn't like good <laughs> You make me mad because I know this is a good idea. I told my wife that I was like, I'm just mad. This is such a great idea. I want to steal it right now. If I write like a magical chef book, don't think that I stole the idea. I was writing that before I met you. Yeah. All right. <laughs> the social <fact> <laughs> <laughs> it, got, it got really quiet for a second. I felt like Canadian seething on the other end. No, you will not. No, Canadians tend to either check you or be passive aggressive. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Which one were you going to be? I probably, I, I'm not really <laughs> sure because honestly, like the Asian-ness equals passive aggressive, but the, oh, can, the me, Canadian, <laughs> the true Canadian <laughs> part is. It adds to it. Yeah. So you have the Asian passive aggressiveness and then you have the Canadian passive aggressiveness to make you a super passive aggressive person. I'm trying to work on it. It. <laughs> oh my god. But yeah, I'm it's most just... active on Twitter. On uh, what's your Twitter, hand uh, Twitter handle? At Roselle Writer. Okay. Yep. 
and the website rosellim.com. It was a fantastic um, conversation. I've really enjoyed talking with you and having, you know, getting a grasp of the experiences that you're that you're going through. And I'm yes. sure a lot of people are very interested in hearing this story. It was really great hearing it myself. Thank you very much for having me. Bye. Bye-bye.